Welcome to Brew Crime, a true crime and beer podcast. This is a podcast where we pick a theme, cover a few cases, and pair them with craft beer. Join me, Mike. And me, JT. As we explore the world of crime, conspiracies, or whatever catches our attention. You can find us on social media at Brew Crime or our website, brewcrime.com. And you can find us on any podcast app at Brew Crime Podcast. Join us as we discuss the horrible crimes that surround us and maybe, eh, probably, not definitely tip a bottle or two back as you do it. Drink with us the second and last Tuesday of every month. On January 2nd, 2013, 27 year old Noel Paquette walked out of a New Year's Eve party in Sarnia, Ontario at about 2 a.m. She had attended the party with her boyfriend when they had a blowout fight and Noel stormed out and headed home. She tried to get a taxi, but being New Year's Eve, she couldn't get a cab. So she decided to walk home all the way to Courtright, which is south of Sarnia, where she had recently bought a house. Several witnesses saw her walking down the street crying. That was the last time she would be seen alive. From the south shore of Lake Erie, this is Great Lakes True Crime. With a population of about 72,000 people, Sarnia, Ontario is located on Lake Huron at the mouth of the St. Clair River. The city is known as a large petrochemical hub and sits very close to the United States border. By car, Sarnia is about an hour drive north of Detroit, Michigan and an hour west of London, Ontario. Sarnia is the birthplace of Sean Burr a former hockey player with the mighty Detroit Red Wings, and Dave Madden, better known as Reuben Kincaid on the TV sitcom The Partridge Family. As many residents were recovering from a night of partying, Lynn Paquette was worried sick because she couldn't get a hold of her daughter, Noelle. Lynn eventually called police and explained that she and her daughter were supposed to see each other that day but she hadn't seen Noelle and couldn't get a hold of her through cell phone, text message, or any other means. Lynn and Noelle were exceptionally close, often speaking to each other four or five times a day. After police became involved, a massive search effort was launched in an attempt to locate the school teacher. Hundreds of people joined the search party on the morning of Wednesday, January 2nd. They scoured the streets of Aunt Sarnia along with businesses and homes in the city's south end. At 10.30 a.m. that morning, the Ontario Provincial Police reported that an adult female body was found in a woodlot on Mandaman Road. The body, unfortunately, turned out to be that of Noelle. It was apparent that she had been murdered. The Sarnia community showed a tremendous outpouring of sorrow and love for Noelle, Friends and family launched a Facebook memorial called Prayers for Noelle Marie Paquette, which had attracted more than 6,000 likes by Friday afternoon. Hundreds of people attended a memorial event at Sarnia's Centennial Park a couple days later. Noelle was born on December 11, 1985, and was a teacher and a tutor with the local Catholic school board. She had three siblings and had recently completed a long-term substitute teaching position at St. Matthew's School in Sarnia, filling in for a teacher on maternity leave. As well as teaching, Noelle also worked at a nonprofit called Community Living Sarnia Lambden, 
and volunteered her time with another nonprofit called the Sunshine Foundation. Noel enjoyed playing soccer and attending classes at a local gym called Good Life Fitness. By all accounts, Noel was greatly loved by the community and everyone that knew her. She was described by one person as a beautiful person inside and out. Someone else said she was someone who makes you laugh until you can't stop. She was sassy and strong-willed, gentle and kind, a wonderful teacher, an amazing daughter. One of the parents of the students said that her son loved Noel, noting that her child would say how much he missed his beloved teacher on weekends. So back to the night that Noel went missing, it was just after 4 a.m. on New Year's Day 2013. Two Ontario Provincial Police officers approached a white Pontiac Grand Prix that appeared to be broken down on the side of the road, just on the outskirts of Sarnia. Inside the car were a 31-year-old woman named Tanya Bogdanovich and a 22-year-old man named Michael McGregor. Bogdanovich actually got out of the car before police reached it. She was crying and had blood on her face and hands. She told the officers that her friend in the passenger seat had cut himself. Then she said she and McGregor were out to try sexualized, quote, knife play. They said they'd driven out into the country to celebrate the New Year by indulging in their kinky relationship. On the car floor on the driver's side was a knife that looked like it had been freshly cleaned off in the snow. The pair tried to convince the police that what they were up to was weird, but nothing criminal or sinister. Bogdanovich explained that the car had run out of oil, causing it to stall out. While sitting in the immobile Grand Prix, she said the two decided to experiment with knife play, and in doing so, McGregor had badly hurt himself. I mean... So far, everything seems pretty standard, right? The two police officers called an ambulance, and Bogdanovich and McGregor were allowed to wait in the car until it arrived, and while they were in the car, they were seen kissing passionately. The two were transported by the ambulance to a hospital in Sarnia. On the ride to the hospital, McGregor smiled and asked the paramedic, quote, is this the strangest thing you have ever had? At the hospital, while McGregor was being tended to, Bogdanovich had her nose pressed up against the treatment room window, and she was pacing back and forth. By the concerned look on her face, hospital staff thought she was McGregor's mother. Later, the two were seen in the emergency room area holding each other, kissing and embracing. In one of the treatment rooms, witnesses saw them lying on the stretchers with their hands to their faces, giggling and laughing uncontrollably. It didn't take investigators long to put two and two together, and on Friday, January 4th, police announced that Tanya Bogdanovich and Michael McGregor were arrested without incident the previous afternoon, just one day after Noel's remains were discovered. Although they were arrested in London, Ontario, Bogdanovich and McGregor both lived in Sarnia, although in separate homes. When the pair were arraigned on first-degree murder charges, McGregor appeared in court with both his hands wrapped in splints and taped as a result of those so-called knife play injuries in the car. Bogdanovich was a 2010 graduate of Lambden College in Sarnia and held several positions at the college including as a bartender at the campus pub and vice president of the student council. She had been raised by a single mother and was said to have had a high level of self-confidence. As a teenager, she was fun and quirky, someone who didn't want to fit in. After her parents divorced when Bogdanovich was a child, her mother eventually remarried and Tanya's rebellious attitude led to constant conflict with her stepfather. Tensions in the family escalated to the point where the 15-year-old Bogdanovich was sent to live in a group home with other troubled teens. 
At first, Bogdanovich was content living in the group home setting. She didn't have to deal with her stepfather's strict discipline, but she quickly fell into a pattern of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse at the group home. It was a living nightmare, and she begged her mother to let her move back home. Bogdanovich's mother, however, refused to let her move back in, effectively choosing her husband over her own daughter. At the age of 18, Bogdanovich was able to move out of the group home and into an apartment. In a short amount of time, Tanya Bogdanovich got married and had two children. Her husband, however, walked out on the family, leaving Bogdanovich to struggle to pay the bills as a single mother herself. She would take any jobs that she could to make money. Bogdanovich eventually saved up some money and put herself through nursing school. After graduation, she found a job at a senior center and found some happiness in a new relationship. While her live-in boyfriend was by all accounts a decent man and a good partner for Bogdanovich in many ways, she found that she was kind of bored and dissatisfied. So Tanya Bogdanovich turned to the internet looking for someone a little more adventurous. On a social media site for people interested in bondage, dominance, and sadomasochism, she met the 18-year-old McGregor as a young man who had always been a bit of a loner. He spent a great deal of time on the internet as a teenager and started looking at online porn. When he left home for college, he tried to seek out some relationships, but didn't really have much luck. So he went back to the internet, creating a profile on a website focused on fetish sex. And that's how he met the much older Bogdanovich. The couple became what Bogdanovich, who had her own, quote, sexual bucket list of things she wanted to do, described in her many texts and online activities as a perfect match. They called themselves Sterling Archer and Lana Kane after characters in their favorite TV program. It was an animated series called Archer, and it aired on the FX cable network. I've never heard of this show before personally, and I'm totally unfamiliar with it, so I can't say anything about it, good or bad. But their activities escalated from roleplay rape fantasies to knife play to ultimately hatching a plan to abduct a young victim for a totally disgusting forest rape fantasy that the two had concocted and shared together. This is how the whole terrible ordeal started, and now Bogdanovich and McGregor were to be tried for murder among quite a few other crimes. In April 2015, a judge ordered the trial to be heard outside of Sarnia because of all the publicity that the case had received locally. Plus, the facilities were small and outdated, and this was definitely going to be a very publicized trial with lots of media attention. So Superior Court Justice Thomas Heaney, the region's senior justice, decided that the relatively close city of Windsor was the most suitable location for the jury trial which was slated for April 2016. For those not familiar with the area, Windsor, Ontario is directly across the river from Detroit, Michigan. The larger urban center of Windsor would have a much larger jewelry pool, so jurors were less likely to be aware of the details of the case and presumably less biased going into the trial. Windsor also had a new provincial justice center which was said to be more ideal for efficient prisoner transport. The materials presented at the trial started to fill in the blanks of what had actually happened that night. The evidence against Bogdanovich and McGregor was overwhelming. These were hardly criminal masterminds after all. Both of them eventually pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in December 2015 when it was very clear that the two would be found guilty in a jury trial. So in February 2016, the truly horrific and stunning details about the abduction, assault, and murder of 27-year-old Noel by McGregor and Bogdanovich began to be read into the record 
at the pair's sentencing hearing. Through the entire hearing, the two of them, seated in separate glass prisoners' boxes, looked at the floor or straight ahead. The two would never make eye contact, even when walking directly past each other. The sentencing hearing uncovered a very disturbing account that underlined how these two killers, who had only known each other for seven months through that fetish social networking site, were connected by a weird, disgusting, violent desire for sex and ultimately to assault and stab a woman. And from an agreed statement of facts, the assistant crown attorney, Michael Carnegie, told Superior Court Justice Bruce Thomas that Noel, who again was a teacher, tutor, community volunteer, was abducted at random and was basically in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was driven around for about 12 or 13 miles to a very remote rural road where she was, quote, directed at knife point, unquote, to walk into the woods, and it was at that point she was assaulted. The evidence made it clear that Noel fought back. She fought with all her might and force against these two attackers, who were drawn together by that fetish website. Bogdanovich, who started searching that site, had a boyfriend and three children at the time. But again, Bogdanovich was bored or whatever, and McGregor had no luck with the ladies at college. So they met on that website. The first time they actually got together in person was June 2012. And they didn't have any sort of normal romantic encounter. They actually had a sort of rape scene together, which is beyond disturbing. So there's quite a few other disturbing details about their desires and interests and fantasies, but I'm not going to go into those. Suffice to say that the relationship had very disgusting and disturbing fetishes and fantasies, and apparently it wasn't the greatest relationship either. Shocker, I know. There was a lot of jealousy on both sides over things that the other were doing. But at the sentencing, they both said they wished they could reverse their actions and bring Noel back to life. At the same time, they did not ask for forgiveness. McGregor said, quote, I want to say sorry, I know I can't change or take back what I've done, no matter how much I wish I could. What I did was terrible, and because of it, Noelle is gone, when instead she should still be with you. I'm not asking for your forgiveness, I don't deserve it, and can never hope for it. End quote. Tanya Bogdanovich's voice broke as she acknowledged the all encompassing pain that she caused Noelle's family, and friends. Quote, One night forever changed the course of many lives and it can never be undone. End quote. She also said that she regretted waiting so long to plead guilty to her crimes. At least one member of Noel's family left the courtroom while Bogdanovich spoke. Others looked down and wiped tears from their eyes. Their offenses carried an automatic life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years. The pair were also required to be added to the DNA bank and sex offender registry and face a lifetime firearms ban in Canada. They're also required to refrain from contacting any of Noel's family or friends. When handing down that automatic sentence, which was the most strict available under law, Ontario Superior Court Judge Bruce Thomas said that the pair's vile and despicable actions required them to be removed from society for most of their lives. Some might say all of their lives, but apparently that was the most strict sentence available. Noel's fa father, Roger Paquette, said outside the courthouse that the sentence was neither an ending nor a beginning. He did say that it was a message to everyone to be cautious but not afraid, to live life to the fullest, and to love and be kind. He said, quote, Our memories of our daughter Noelle have given us the courage to live on. Noelle Marie Paquette is interred at Resurrection Cemetery in Sarnia, Ontario. She lives on not only in the memories of family and friends, but there are a number of online memorials 
in both website format and on social media, featuring memory, memories of Noel and tributes. There's also a very active charity in Sarnia called Noel's Gift to Children. This organization's slogan is, quote, dedicated to improving the lives of children in our communities. And that's exactly what they do through a student nutrition program, stocking school supply cabinets, hosting community days, and many other activities. There is a Light Up the Night for Noel 5K road race this September. For more information on Noel's Gift to Children, please check them out online at noelsgift.ca. Now let me switch gears here for a minute. I have a quick streaming recommendation before we wrap things up. I recently caught the series Hijack on Apple TV. It's a seven episode series starring Idris Elba, who of course also starred in the greatest TV show ever, Luther. Okay, greatest except for the X-Files and maybe The Shield and Republic of Doyle and the original Magnum PI, but I digress. The basic plot of the story involves the hijacking of a commercial airplane traveling from Dubai to London. I was at first skeptical that seven episodes about a hijacking would hold my attention, but it definitely did. I highly recommend checking out Hijack if you haven't done so already. And that's all for this episode of Great Lakes True Crime. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Great Lakes True Crime. You can also check out links in the show notes for sources and more information. Also, you may notice a bit of rebranding for the show. I'm trying to move a bit away from the darkness. Thanks to those of you who recently left positive reviews through your podcast app. And if you do like the show, please tell a friend about it. Also, I recently received several donations online. Those are super appreciated as they help keep the show going. You can email me at greatlakestruecrime at gmail.com with any thoughts or case suggestions. For Great Lakes True Crime, this has been Steve, your host and producer. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank you.